Next up, it's a swift return to cup action in the League Cup, where we will entertain Charlton Athletic. Kick-off is at 7.30pm. Uh, I'm not aware of any TV or streaming sources being available, but uh, I'm sure you'll find them if necessary. Should the scores be level at 90 minutes, it'll go straight to penalties. Though, given the history of messing about with this particular competition, a round of rock, scissors, paper wouldn't be too much of a surprise as is the fact that they've already done the draw for the next round, the winners being at home to the winners of the Leeds versus Hull City tie. So, Charlton then. They were relegated last term. This was despite Sheffield Wednesday picking up a 12-point deduction for financial irregularities. The powers that be decided that that particular sanction wouldn't come into effect until this season. So it was down to Division 3, or if you really must, League 1, with Charlton who were relegated alongside Wigan, who went down because they did have their 12-point deduction applied in the same season. Not that anyone should be that bothered about Wigan, but it must be very galling for Charlton supporters who join ourselves in the long-suffering class of football supporter. This is the second preview running that I've had to comment on a potential change in ownership for our opponents. Now this all gets a bit complicated, so please pay attention at the back. In the beginning, there was Roland du Chatelet. Sometime businessman and politician, Du Chatelet has owned a number of clubs over the years, including Standard Liège and two names that will instill a sense of nostalgia in those of a certain age, Karl Zeiss Jena in the former East Germany and Hungary's Wiespest, who somewhere along the line appear to have lost their doja. Du Chatelet's tenure at the Valley was marked by numerous protests over the way the club was being misrun. Do you seem to recall some form of protest involving tennis balls. No chance of that one working at the Olympic then. So you'd have thought that the purchase of the club in January by an outfit calling themselves East Street Investments might have come as some sort of blessed relief after the depressing Du Chatelet years. Well that might have been the case, but for a major falling out between major shareholders Tanu Nima and Matt Southall. Nima was accused of failing to provide evidence of funding as required by the authorities. Nima, for his part, accused Southall of misusing club's funds, including the purchase of a fleet of Range Rovers. Whether due to a lack of funds or because of all the hassle, Nima decided to get out after only six months, and a consortium put together by lawyer Chris Farnell, including a Manchester-based businessman by the name of Paul Elliott, was announced by the new owners. If the name Farnell rings vague alarm bells, well done on your memory for it was he who was ubiquitous during the ill-fated attempts to rescue Berry last season. So, Elliot and Chums own Charlton now, right? Uh, no, I did tell you it was complicated. The legal transfer of ESI has yet to be completed, and even if that legal nicety had been completed, there would still be issues. The presence of disqualifying conditions mean that neither Elliot nor Farnell are considered by the English Football League to be fit and proper persons to own a football club. That being the case... Nima decided to take his 65% shareholding elsewhere, with Danish businessman Thomas Sandergaard agreeing to purchase those shares. Somewhat miffed by this turn of events, Elliot elected to go to court, arguing that his appeal against the EFL decision was still outstanding. Though the judge wasn't over-impressed, he did give Elliot some time to get his backside in gear, and they're currently in the last few days of an interim injunction that prevents the sale of the club. Once that period expires, the sale to US-based Sandgard is expected to go through. Until then, as far as I can work out, the only person who doesn't want to own the club is the person who actually owns the club. All clear? So once the sale goes through, all will be well then, won't it? Well, far be it for me to point out another thundercloud on the horizon, but it would appear that the valley is still owned by De Chatelet. Having a ground owned by your ex-owner is something that rarely ends well. As the song goes, there may be trouble ahead. The ownership issues have, understandably, made the introduction of new talent in advance of the new season a bit tricky for boss Lee Bowyer, especially since the league has them under a transfer embargo of sorts. They can sign players, but the constraints effectively mean that until the ownership situation is resolved, it has to be one in, one out. They are allowed a 23-player squad, but that includes any of the kids who've ever played a first 11 game in the past irrespective of whether they would be considered for selection these days. Daisy, the socially bubbled personal assistant with a beautiful smile, tells me that they brought in midfielder Alex Gilby from Milton Keynes Dons. Dagenham-born, he started his career with Colchester, 
which is still the club for which he's made the most league appearances, despite interim spells at Wigan and Milton Keynes. They also ventured north of the border to bring in heart striker Connor Washington. The 28-year-old is fairly well-travelled. Having been turned down by Norwich and Peterborough as a kid, he became a postman, having a prolific time of things with St Ives Town, that's the Cambridgeshire one rather than the Cornish one. Leaving a trail of little elastic bands behind him, he moved up and down the country with intervals at Newport County, Peterborough, Sheffield United and QPR before he elected to take a year out of football to join Hearts in the Scottish Premier League. Although English by birth, a convenient grandparent qualifies him for Northern Ireland for whom he has over 20 caps to date. A couple of under-23 signings from non-league apart, the only other arrival has been midfielder Dylan Levitt who's coming on loan from Manchester United for the season. He has as many full international caps for Wales, one, as he has first 11 appearances for Manchester United, also one. They will be hoping that he will make a similar impact to Josh Cullen, who was well thought of during his loan spell at the Valley last season. I guess it's early days to be talking about form, but they are joint second in the league, having beaten a crew side containing Will, son of UC Jaskalainen, 2 0 on the opening day of the league season at the weekend. Prior to that, they'd beaten Swindon 3 1 away in the first round of the League Cup to qualify for this tie. There was also a 2-1 defeat to AFC Wimbledon in the EFL Trophy, but nobody's really too much bothered about that one. Well, enough of them. Let's move on to the wild and wacky world of association football. Congratulations are due to PGMOL, who managed to last almost three minutes before giving Liverpool an illegal penalty. This included a deflection of the sort we were told would not result in a penalty. Uh, To quote the comment, Handball will not be awarded if the ball touches a player's hand or arm directly from their own hand, head, body, foot or the head, body, foot of another player who is close or nearby. Of course, that's something that should easily have been sorted out by VAR. Of course, with Liverpool being involved, it wasn't. Elsewhere, we gained an interesting insight into the defend your mates mentality within the refereeing fraternity from the Crystal Palace vs Southampton match. Kyle Walker-Peters was originally red-carded by referee John Moss. BT Sport had Dermot Gallagher on hand to comment on the refereeing matters. Can't argue with that, was Gallagher's verdict. Definite red card. Then the VAR people got involved, suggesting that Moss should have another shifty on the pitch sky screen, which up to now has merely been there to give the ball boys something to bump into. On review, Moss correctly downgraded the red to yellow, whereupon a strange bout of amnesia overcame Gallagher. Yes, that was clearly reckless rather than excessive force. Definitely a right decision, only a yellow card, was his amended verdict. Wouldn't it have been great had somebody said, hang on Dermot, you've watched it three times and it was a red. Why have you changed your mind now? Sadly nobody did. OK, let's move on to us then, with a due sense of foreboding as ever. On the KUMB Facebook page last week, somebody gave me a bit of stick, complaining that the coverage in these pages was all too negative. Well, if that's a gripe of yours, I'd look away now because I'm going to be damned if I'm going to try and gloss over a performance like that. Post-match, Moyes hinted that he was unhappy with the match officials. Whilst I have some sympathy with that view, we would have had two penalties had we been playing at Anfield in red, and Carroll's two yellow card offences proved yet again that Stuart Atwell shouldn't be allowed near a football match of any sort. However, it was most disturbing to hear the manager repeating ad infinitum that his opinion was that the group that finished last season are capable of so much more. This suggests to me that the feeling is generally that the squad is good enough as it is. Clearly is not. It wasn't good enough last season. Our 16th place, remember, owed as much to the fact that there were four teams worse than us in the league, even if you do view 16th place as some sort of success. Positives? Sorry, I'll have to get back to you on that. Oh wait, for the first time in eons, at the time of writing, we have nobody on the injured list, which with the clearance of Sujek to play on Saturday, was the case for the Newcastle match, so we don't even have that excuse to fall back on. We were slow, painfully slow. Now, Dean Garner, whilst not over-experienced at top-flight level, does have a bit of pace. Shame we sold him, really, then, isn't it? The money from Dean Garner is supposedly going to strengthen the squad. So far, this has consisted of our sticking in a bid to a club that doesn't want to sell a player who doesn't want to move. Well, which is fair enough, because on past record, we probably won't want to pay. Usually, the League Cup sees us resting first-choice players to give the youngsters a run-out. Frankly, I'd pick the strongest team available to get some match fitness back in the legs. I'm struggling to see anyone on the squad list who deserves a night off anyway. I suspect, however, that changes will be wrong, simply because it's what teams do for the League Cup, all of which makes a prediction all the more difficult. 
So this is pure guesswork on my part. I will wager the £2.50 that it wasn't going to pay somebody for something they don't want to sell me in the first place on a home win. Let's say 2-1 to us, please, Mr Winston, and maybe I'll stick a cheeky side bet on it going to penalties. Enjoy the game.